Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we are going to be talking, we have the Bears 53-man roster. We have the regular season less than a week away. We're going to be talking Cubs. We're going to be talking White Sox and a whole bunch more. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. Sure, the season's not going on right now because nothing is going on right now because of COVID, but that shouldn't stop you from getting a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more at icehogs.com. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, how have you been, my friend? I have been great. I had a nice, really long weekend, four-day weekend, and it was great because I saw some friends. I saw some family. The weather was really nice. I really, really, really am going to miss this type of weather because what we got this weekend was perfect. It's going to cool a little bit, and you know, before you know it, it's going to be cold again, and Right before this weekend, it was so unbearably hot. So we found that perfect middle ground this weekend, and I enjoyed every minute of it while it lasted. Yeah, I uh, <clears throat> I have friends in California, and uh, one lives in Reseda, which if you've been watching um, Cobra Kai uh, is one of the main – it's where uh, Cobra Kai is located in Reseda, California. Um, posted yesterday – the, his phone, like that app temperature on his phone, 117, mm-hmm. 117. Oh my. How is that livable, man? Like, you know what? Today was beautiful. What was it like 70 degrees? Oh, it was great. I went on a long walk today. And then a friend of mine who was in town, we went to the park. We took our mitts in a, an old league ball. And we just played catch for a while. It was awesome. Yeah, right now it's 64 degrees and partly cloudy. It's perfect. This is this is my jam weather. Uh, I told my wife like my dream would be to live in Santa Cruz, California. Um because it's if you look at the weather, it's 65 all year round. It's like this all year round. Yeah. And yeah. Like I I'm more than okay with that. Um The one thing that's making me kind of sad right now is the days are getting short again. Yeah, that's that's gonna that's the kicker. And you know what? It's I'm not gonna lie. There's sometimes like you know June June July when the days are like really long. You're just like, all right, I could I could settle for the sun going down a little bit, a little bit earlier. Especially if you got a little one, because you're starting to try to put them down in the bed, and then they're like, but it's still light out. You're like, yeah, but it's eight <laughs> thirty. You need to go to bed. Um, but. I don't know, in the winter, man, when it's like it starts getting dark at like two in the afternoon, like the depression starts setting in because you never see the sun because you're at work all day. Um, it's now, new. what I don't like, what I really hate, though I might not deal with it as much this year because I haven't been in the office, is when it's winter and you're leaving the office at five o'clock and it's already pitch black out. Yeah, that's that's the one nice thing about working from home for the foreseeable future is. I can at least go outside and see the sun and I'm not driving home Mm -hmm. in the dark. It is. um, So it won't be too bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a little different with the working from home. Do they give you an estimate of how long you'll be working from home or is it just TBD? Nah, nobody knows. It's TBD, but frankly, I don't see us going back this year. Yeah. They, we already, my, my job, we know we're not going back this year. They, they're talking, um, you know, whenever we return from the New Year's Day off for the New Year's weekend, um, mm-hmm. that 
that's tentatively when we'll come back, but who knows? You never know. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not banking on that either. Yeah. All right. So, where do you want to start? Well, I mean, you know, let's get all the other stuff out of the way because I feel like this is going to be a pretty big bear show, considering we're kind of getting ready for the season here. Um, guess we could start with base. Ball. that's going on right now uh so cubs finally got a win today versus the cardinals um they've been really kicking our teeth um it's been frustrating this this cubs team sure they're still in first place and based on the the, the numbers i think we're at like 96 percent chance of making the playoffs um mm -hmm. so i'm not really worried about making the playoffs per se but uh, the way that the playoff format is, um, you know, this year and, it, it, you know, you're going to be in these short series with, with teams, it, you know, it's, you need, you need to be hitting, you need to be scoring runs. And this Cubs team really struggles sometimes scoring runs, man. Uh, I mean, how many, how many times are they going to have leave runners in scoring position? How many times are they going to have uh, runners in scoring position with less than two outs and not drive home a run? On Saturday alone, they were one for 26 with runners on base. One for 26. Well, you saw the classic bases loaded, nobody out. You didn't get a single run. That seems to happen quite a bit. Their numbers with the bases loaded are just wretched this year. I mean, it's really, really bad. And, you know, even when they do score with the bases loaded, it feels like and I'm talking bases loaded, nobody out. They Several times they've scored zero runs. Other times they've bases loaded, zero outs, they'll get like one on like a sack fly or something. And then the next two guys will strike out or they'll ground out weakly and not advance the runners. We see that way, way, way too much. And you know what's kind of crazy? Remember last year when it was all about them being terrible on the road? Well, they seem better on the road this year in terms of scoring runs. Because they were able to score in Cincinnati and in Pittsburgh. Now, that finale in Pittsburgh, they had the uh, guys on woes, the RISP woes, as I call them. Um, but overall, on the road trip, they did at least score runs. And it seems like when they come home is when they really start to struggle. It feels like at home, they're always just trying to kill the ball and send it into Waveland or Sheffield Avenue when you got to just be shortening up and... You know, I got to tell you, it's really amazing the Cubs are at the record that they are, that they're in first place, that they are pretty close to being a lot to being in the postseason, considering Bryant, Baez have both been really bad overall this year. Contreras started off really good, and he's kind of dipped down. He's been better the past few games, but, you know, Rizzo has been really streaky too. We, uh, let me, let it's me, just this so frustrating. Chris Bryant's OPS. We're more than halfway through this. I mean, we're at like what, almost two thirds of the way through the season. We just have a few more weeks. Yeah, Chris Bryant's OPS is five seventy six. I mean, that's gut wrenchingly terrible. Like, that's not just like subpar mediocre. That is unbelievably awful. His slugging percentage is three eleven. What? When? When's the last time you saw him drive the ball? Like, honestly. Yeah, and I it seems like all of his contact is just weak. He can't yeah. square it up at all. It's it's frustrating. It's frustrating. And this is a guy that we're going to, we have to make a decision on is paying him. And he hasn't looked the same in now two years. And you know, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, like looking at this issue, going with Baez, comparing Brian to Baez. Yeah, Baez strikes out a lot. We know that. he's He's always done it. He's done it a lot this year. And you could kind of tell it was in his head, but... You know, if you watch the past few series, even if he's not getting hits, he's had a lot more solid contact. So at least he's making good contact with the ball. He's not hitting it out of the park. He's not hitting it often, but he is making some contact. Where you look at Chris Bryant, he's had a few hits the past few nights, but even his hits are just like little flares. And I'm not trying to be overly picky. A hit's a hit, but I like 
I just when's the last time he really just had a few consecutive at bats where at least he made solid contact? Tim Anderson's batting average is higher than Chris Bryant's slugging percentage. Yeah, wow. Javi Baez Sox fans laugh away. I mean, that's yeah. that's bad. Javi Baez slugging is three sixty five right now. His OPS is six eleven. Anthony Rizzo's OPS yeah. is seven seven eight. Schwarber's is seven eight nine. Contreras is seven forty four. Caratini's is six seventeen. Um, Nico Horner's is five seventy eight. How are you winning games like this? Ian Happ. Ian Happ is your best player. Best by far. Jason Kipnis yeah. might be your second best. <laughs> I'd also put Jason Hayward on the list. He's been doing really well. But we don't, I mean, uh, what's going on with him? Yeah, I, I, I heard last night how, what, he was having trouble breathing? He was having trouble breathing and was feeling dizzy and they uh, he went to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, that was out of nowhere too. There were, you know, obviously a lot of this happened out of nowhere, but you wouldn't have known like the past few nights that this was going to happen. Obviously, and he's really been one of their better hitters. He was hitting over 300 going into this series. He's been hitting the ball very, very hard. Um, but you know, outside those guys we just talked about, a lot of underperforming, a lot of struggles, and you know. I look at a guy like Nico Horner and I just simply say, I just don't think he's ready. And if this were a regular season, I'd be more inclined to believe that he would have started in the minor leagues, just with there being no minor leagues this year and Nico Horner already having a dose of MLB experience that they were going to let him play, just not in South Bend. And, you know, speaking of South Bend, you see some of the other hitters, Albert Almora was sent down there and, I don't know about you, but I think we've seen the last of Albert Almora as a Cub. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't bring anything to this team. He really doesn't. No. I mean, he's, an, oh, no. he's, he's, a, he's a decent fielder, but nothing to warrant starting him. Um, he's a defensive replacement at best, a uh, pinch hitter. Um, but, I mean, going back to your Nico Horner point, is it's a tough situation because you, he's a young kid. You need to give him at the bats. But Jason Kipnis is the hot hand and the veteran. And if you really want to compete, I, you need to be playing Jason Kipnis right now because he's, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, as sad as it sounds, you're right. Is he's the, he's got the third highest OPS of your regular players. Yeah. J washed up Jason Kipnis. Yeah. I mean, Hayward is second and, and Ian Happ and, and, and it seems like Ian Happ's finally the guy that's figured out the leadoff spot. Yeah, I mean, you see him hitting home runs and doubles to start off. He's been leading off games, getting on base. And, you know, today he had a leadoff double and then he had three walks. So he's taking his walks when he gets them. And when the ball's in the strike zone, he's swinging and hitting them. I mean, he's doing everything very timely. He's hitting for power. He's kind of spraying the ball a bit. I mean, you know, not like a slappy hitter, but he's able to go the opposite field for hits as well. And I think it's pretty obvious that he's a better hitter from the left side. I, I do kind of can't help but wonder if he may just select one day to say, you know what, I want to just hit lefty. We've seen that happen before with switch hitters, but either way, the overall body of work is really, really good. And you know, we talked about this last week, how they brought in some depth. Uh, they brought in Jose Martinez and Cameron Mabin. And Mabin, to me, is more just the defensive guy. He had a very nice double today. And Martinez has not had a hit yet as a Cub. And he's got a very nice career slash line. But, you know, this year between Tampa Bay and here, he hasn't really done much. I just, overall, the hitting depth on this team just is not very good. We just DFA'd Steven Souza Jr. because he wasn't doing anything. But, you know, I'm, you, you need I'm, depth to produce. I'm perfectly fine with them DFAing Souza because he was terrible. But yeah. they claimed Billy Hamilton. Yeah. Cub Billy, killer Billy Hamilton. Do you want to know what Billy Hamilton's slash line is this year? Do I? His slash line is zero four five zero eight three zero four five. 
I feel like you should be the dean from Animal House reading that <laughs> slash line. <laughs> oh, I, uh, I really I should have done it in that 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 total impersonation, but it is terrible. Um, I mean, what purpose does he come in except for defense and pinch running? Yeah, I think they're going to use him kind of like a Terrence Gore. I don't think they're actually going to put him in the starting lineup or really even pinch hit for that matter. I'm not really thrilled about having him like as a lineup guy. Again, I don't think he's going to be used as much. But I, I will admit, I do kind of look forward to him pinch running in big situations. I, I think that's the only way you can and should use him. I mean, maybe it's it's a small ball thing come playoffs is you get it, get him on steals second and then puts the pressure on the pitcher um you get a you get either a one in the dirt or one gets away and suddenly you're at third and you know um a a infield grounder can can score him you know you, you look at you look at some teams that have done that and and you get a speedster on base or you get a guy on base and and you pinch run him and and that can really spark spark a team in the playoffs when you're you got your top guys pitching, yeah, you, know, you see the runs lower. So I, that's the only thing I can think of. But I mean, Billy Hamilton is terrible. So I mean, he got yeah, no, he's he's not going to hit. He's, he's not going to hit. He's on his, he's he's a Terrence score. He's on his third team this year because he was on the Mets and the Giants, right? Yep. Or was it the Braves? No, he was uh, the Giants. He was DFA'd. Was he on the Braves last year? Might have been last year. But he was DFA'd by the Giants before the start of the season. And then um, he appeared in 17 games with the Mets. Um, I do it, think it's irony, though, because Billy Hamilton seemed to be able to swing the bats so well against the Cubs in his entire career. I know. It's, it's funny because he was always that guy you were just like, all right, Billy Hamilton's up. And you're like, at least we know he's not going to hit a home run because he has like negative four home runs this year. And then he's like, oh, Billy Hamilton, the lines went off the wall. And you're just like, damn it. How the hell is this guy doing it? And he stretches like a single into a triple because, you know, relay throw was late. And you're just like, what the hell, this guy? But we'll see. Um, And it's it's funny. I was trying to take some notes of what I wanted to talk about today and and uh, I, I wrote down, I'm intrigued by Matt Dermody. And I'm like, he came in and he's one appearance. <laughs> and I'm like, he's thrown some nice heat out of the bullpen. Uh, you know, struck out a guy swinging with, with a fastball in the zone. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm into that. All right, he's got some movement on a fastball. And we've talked about how, you know, we need some some heavy throwers in the bullpen. I'm like, okay, what do we have in this guy? Now I'm curious. And they designated him. <laughs> so it's like, what the hell? I, I, I honestly, I can't figure out some of the moves the Cubs are making. It it honestly seems like there's a lot of desperation that they see that they see this is the oh, last. Oh yeah, thing. I mean, it's trying to find it's trying to find as much uh, leftover glue and popsicle sticks as you could find. Because this team is on, the window is closing. Um, you know, they've talked about what dire straits they are in financially. Um, you've you've got to pay Javi Baez. You've got to pay uh, Chris Bryant. You, you know, you're going to soon have to pay Anthony Rizzo. You're not getting the production. And these guys are going to want, you know, big time money. But they're not producing big time like you would expect them to. Um, you know, you've, you've only got two starters locked in for next year. And luckily they're your top two starters. So early in the season, you had the Cubs winning a lot of games and jumping out to a really good, uh, I guess, record in the beginning of the season, which was really important in this shortened season, but it was all on the backs of the starting pitching, which was phenomenal. I mean, one through five, you were getting great performances pretty much every day. And now that we're the better part of almost two thirds of the way through the season is what you really have is you Darvish, who is one of the best pitchers in the national league. And then you have a one big step back. You have Kyle Hendricks 
And then from there is a major drop off. And you're riding the backs of 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 two good pitchers and then rolling the dice with what you got. Well, I think one of the biggest things we have to mention, and it's it's really sad to say, but John Lester has nothing left. Nothing. I mean, we were talking at the beginning of the season that maybe John Lester found some sort of voodoo magic um, to help lengthen his career. And um, like, uh, what's his name in that went from Detroit to uh, the Astros? And everyone thought he was washed up. Verlander. Verlander thought he was washed up and then just found this fountain of youth. You're like, all right, maybe maybe Lester figured something out. He's, he wasn't he wasn't getting swings and misses, but he was getting a lot of weak contact and he was powering through. And you're like, okay. And if you looked, the first three starts of the season, he was 2-0 and with a 1.08 ERA. In the five starts since then, He's 0 and 2 with a 926 ERA and eight home runs. He's not missing bats at all. I think he's got the lowest swing and miss rate in the majors or among one of the uh lowest swing and miss rates. I mean, everything is getting hit hard and you look at the 558 fielding independent pitching on the year and the 6.5 strikeouts per 9. You know, last year the ERA didn't look as good, but, you know, the fielding independent pitching was lower than the year before, and the strikeout rate was up. He had a strikeouts per nine of 8.7 last year, so he was at least missing some bats this year. Uh, this year, he's not missing any bats, and when I mean not missing, I really mean not missing. And, yeah, I just, I love old Johnny, but... Uh, he's just cooked, man. And, you know, you can't be mad. He's 36 years old. He has so many miles on that arm between all the regular seasons and all those playoffs. He starts 31-plus games year in, year out. He hasn't started less than 31 games since 2007. I mean, that's a really impressive mark right there to stay that durable that long. Yeah, I mean, he's he's uh, he's had a great career. And the Cubs contract was, he was worth every penny. We knew, we knew the last few years would probably be rough ones. I think we all agreed on that when, Mm -hmm. when he was signed. And I think we've, I think we've gotten more production out of it than we even expected. And I think we, we had high expectations. Um, You know, he was a huge reason why the Cubs made that shift from, up and comers, you know, in a rebuild to perennial contenders and winning a World Series. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was the co MVP of the NLCS in 2016 that won them their first pennant since 1945. He was an all star multiple years. He was a Cy Young finalist. And for the majority of his Cubs career, 2015 through 2018, so, you know, right there, 15, 16, 17, 18. Four of the six years he was here, 128 starts, 3.33 ERA, 367 FIP, strikeouts per nine of 8.6 versus 2.6 base on ball per nine. That right there is just getting it done. It really is. And And, and we we don't win that World Series without him. (laughs) You're right. And we expected pretty ugly the last two years. Maybe even the last three, even I think, I think, you know, the conservative consensus was in this six years that we would get three good years and three bad years. And we got four good years and a serviceable year last year and half of a serviceable year this year. And, you know, we're, we're down to the wire and you know, Johnny, Johnny's at the end of his rope and he's frustrated. He's frustrated because he can't, I mean, everything to where to him to get to this point, it wasn't like a overnight drop off. Like he woke up one day, which is, uh, what we saw with Arietta, where it was a pretty dramatic drop off from, from greatness to mediocrity to, I mean, you know, he's really not good. And it was a pretty, it was a pretty abrupt, you know, 
drop off. With John, it has been, you know, going down, going down, going down. Even in the good years, we didn't get the John Lester magical stuff. It was he was really good, but uh there was there was a lot of holding your breath and and some working himself out of a lot of bad situations uh to get there but he always got got there and and now it's to the point where he's getting hit hard he can't even get into the you know get out of those situations anymore no he was able to use his defense and some well located pitches to get out of it even if he wasn't missing a lot of bats some of those times but i mean all the the only thing he's missing is his spots and the bats are hitting him a very, very long way. And he's not overpowering anybody. He he's not throwing 90 plus anymore. He's in the eighties. Sometimes you get that, uh, snapping curveball working, but boy, the fastball and the cutter, they're, they're getting hit hard. Very, very, very hard. And, you know, I think we can move along just outside John Lester. You look at some of the others, you know, I was glad Jose Quintana was back, and you look at his few uh, appearances he had out of the bullpen, he was actually looking pretty good. He was looking pretty good. Then he gets hurt again. Tyler Chatwood has been hurt twice now. And, you know, I I think Alec Mills has come down to earth a bit. It was yeah. a nice story, but he's I mean, come down to earth a bit. I mean, here's where we're at, is barring injury, we've got two two pitchers we can rely on yep yep after that it is a, who knows what you're getting i mean lester lester's been bad uh we've gone with colin ray uh, albert azale who's gonna pitch again this week um even though he had a bad bad outing against the uh the cardinals alec mills has come back down to earth um chatwood I think he wasn't he supposed to pitch a simulated game today. He might have. Um, I think I think I saw that on Roto World that he was going to pitch a simulated sixty games, sixty uh, pitch inning or uh, I'm sorry, pitch sixty pitch uh, simulated game today. <laughs> words, words. They're stupid words and ugly. But um, so I, I read that he was going to do that today, but I don't. I haven't heard any more about it. Um. And Quintana is, I, I have no idea where he's at. But if these guys don't come back soon, you know, the Cubs might make the playoffs. But, man, they're going to be limping in. Just pitch Darvish and Hendricks. Be like, okay, you're pitching like every other day. Have fun. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it might have to, I mean, it might get to the point where in the playoffs, I mean, uh, the way the way these are going is you might do a three man rotation but it, it's going to be it's going to be tough sledding and I mean, the problem is you don't have a deep bullpen so you can't really do the opener strategy either yeah you you can't um it it's it, it's it's a tough it's a tough situation here yeah and you know i think with alzali i like this stuff i do I think we've seen some promising snaps of him. I just don't know what we're going to get long term, but I could at least say I like this stuff. Against the Cardinals, his location wasn't great. He was a little erratic, and his defense really let him down, and that cost him a lot of pitches. But I can at least say he's got the good stuff. So, you know, let's say he kind of finds his way over his last few starts, and you say, okay. You know, he's young. He doesn't really have experience. But, you know, if he's looking promising, Darvish, Hendricks, Alzali, you know, you could maybe live with that rotation a little bit. It just it really doesn't help that John Lester is doing so poorly, because if he was at least getting by, then you could be like, all right, he could be your fourth starter in the postseason if Alzali is doing well or your third starter and have Alzali four. Because I just don't know if I trust Tyler Chatwood in a postseason scenario. Who knows with Quintana? If Quintana comes back healthy and he's stretched out, then sure, you'd probably go with him. But we don't know about that right now. And you know, Colin Ray doesn't have that much experience as a starter. So, yeah. And, and I mix that up. It's Quintana. Quintana's going to pitch. Um, he's going to pitch tomorrow. Uh, 
he's going to um, he's going to start his throwing program tomorrow, and um, it's it's Chatwood that's um, maybe maybe at the end of the week he could start throwing. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, we need we need these guys back and healthy. I mean, if Chatwood Chatwood was pitching well uh, before he got hurt. Outside that one clunker in KC, yeah, but I can't help but wonder if he was hurting that as well. Yeah, I mean, and, and honestly, we don't need a ton out of him. We just need a serviceable start. And um, this 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 year has been trying as far as getting through. And, and, and man, I, David Ross is, has had a... Is it a tough year? <laughs> it's the bullpen, bullpen imploding and having not a lot of arms. The starting pitching just bottoming out. Uh, hitters not hitting. I got, he's he's got his work cut out for him, man. Yeah, yes, he does. It's not like the first year of Joe Madden where he had a Cy Young historic Jake Arrieta, followed by still in prime John Lester followed by up-and-coming Kyle Hendricks, followed by very solid veteran Jason Hamill. It's a little different than that. Um, you know, so it, it's a... Uh, the, the Cubs are going to have to... I mean, the good news is I think they're done with Cardinals, right? Yeah, that's it with Cardinals. They play the Reds next. The toughest opponents, you'll have the White Sox at the very end on the south side. You'll also play the Indians. You also play the Twins. You have a four-game series against the Pittsburgh Pirates, and you really got to win that. You you got to really at least win three or four there. Yeah, for sure. Um, pad pad those games when you can. Pad those wins. I mean, that's the one thing we can say about the Cubs this year is, for the most part, they've won the matchups they're supposed to. They have only lost one against the Pirates. They're like what five and one against them. I mean, yeah, that's the, what you got to do. It was the one game before this Cardinal series. Right. And then they took three of four against Kansas City. You know, that's getting the job done there. With Cincinnati, um, you know, they have the slight edge. And Cincinnati always gives them kind of a rough time. But, you know, they they should have won three of four in Cincinnati. But Craig Kimbrell blew that game. But at least they're not losing like three or four to those guys. And you still have three more to go uh, this coming week. So if you can win two or three there, you know, that'll be taking care of business. And, um, you know, again, those are the games you got to win. Um, I mean, yeah, honestly, that you have to. Um, you know, the good news is nobody other than the Cardinals in the division look like anything. Uh, I know, but I'm just waiting, man. I'm just waiting for the Brewers to somehow pull something out of their rear end. They better start pulling. <laughs> I know that team is decimated right now. I know that team isn't very good on paper, and Christian Yelich has been awful, and I know there's very little time left. Uh, just the way the things have gone the past few years, I'm just expecting it. That, I mean... You know they just they just don't have anybody to help out Yelich, and Yelich isn't helping out himself. Um, I mean he's he's obviously better than he was early on, but the guy still has he's batting two hundred one. Yeah, you look at some of the big stars in the NL Central. Chris Bryant's struggling. Javi Baez is struggling. Christian Yelich is struggling. Joey Votto has struggled through much of the year. A. Eugenio Suarez has struggled through much of the year. I think Josh Bell isn't doing as good either. I mean, really, the, one of the big stars that's really living up in the NL Central is Paul Goldschmidt, and I don't know if you saw that home run he hit off Lester last night. I did. It went, like, down... It, that had to have gone, like, down Kenmore. I mean, my goodness. And do you know who is DHing for the uh, Brewers right now? Dan Vogelbach? Dan Vogelbach. Are you ready? Are you ready for Dan Vogelbach to have some backbreaking hit against the Cubs when they play them at Miller Park? You know, that's the way it goes. 
he's going to hit it off the Bernie Brewer slide and Bernie Brewer's going to start sliding down and it's going to be detached. And he's going to go flying off the slide and just the big thud on the platform below and he'll just get right back up and climb back up the ladder. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the one shining thing that the, the Cubs can hang their hat on is that they just signed Pedro Strope. Hats to the left. He wasn't gone long. Uh, um, but before we switch to the uh, the White Sox, um, I just wanted to say a moment of silence. Uh, Hall of Famer, former uh, former Cub Lou Brock, um, you know, passed away this week. Uh, was it yesterday or day before? I think it was yesterday. Um. 81 years old and uh you know rest in peace and um you know he'll always be known for the uh the the, the trade yeah brock for brolio brock for brolio um so uh you know rest in peace to him and uh condolences to his family absolutely um Rolling to the south side, uh, I mean that team. That team is got four legit candidates for MVP uh, in their lineup, and it's it's unreal the ways that they can score. Uh, Boy, they have absolutely owned Kansas City this year too, haven't they? They really have. Um, but they've, they, you know, people are like, oh, they beat up on the, the easy teams. But you know what? They're beating up on, they're starting to beat up on everybody. They beat up on the Cubs. They beat up on the Pirates. They beat up on the Royals. Um, the only team they really haven't beaten up or, 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 you know, stood against, stood their own is the Twins. The Twins are the only ones they've struggled with. Um, but y you look at this team and... Uh, Tim Anderson is is basically the cog that drives this team. He's yeah, he's, he could win two batting titles in a row, right? He's yeah, his slash line is three fifty one, three ninety five forty five with a nine eighty five OPS. Um, I think he's got like a one sixty eight WRC plus. Um, you look like Jose Abreu. And he, I think he's got a 167 WRC plus. Um, Eloy's got a 130 WRC plus and is a 281, 315, 549 slash line. Luis Robert, um, he's got almost two war and a 137 WRC plus. Um, What's his WRC plus? 137. 137. Okay, that's that's still pretty good. Yeah. And he's t just twenty, just turned twenty three years old last month. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, and and now you're finally starting to see Edwin and Carcinacion starting to hit, and he was he was brutal, but you know he's back. He's up to eight home runs now, and he's starting to hit the ball a little better. If, if that guy, if that guy can, you know, even give you a decent at bat, this team is just a freight train, like. Yeah. I, it, it's tough, man. You, you know, if the only thing that's that's keeping this team from just being a juggernaut is suspect starting pitching. Um, you know, G Lucas Giolito is starting to find his groove. Uh, we you know we talked about his no no. Dallas Keuchel has been really good, but you know who knows what's going to happen because he left yesterday's game with back stiffness. But up until that point, the guy's six and two uh, with a two one nine ERA and a one point oh five WHIP. Yeah, he was by far and away their most consistent starter. I mean, I don't remember him having like one awful start yet. Yeah, I mean, but it's hopefully it's just a little stiffness and he's day to day and could come back yeah. for his next start. But yeah, that would be brutal for the White Sox if he missed any time because um, you just optioned Ronaldo Lopez because that guy is getting just. Oh, it's bad. We're not. That's yeah, it's bad. I mean, he didn't even go two innings against the Twins and got lit up. 
Yeah, not great. I, I think the days of him as a starter should be over, but you know, it, you might have to make do. I know he was just option, but you might need somebody to fill in towards the end of the season. But um, yeah, I definitely think the Sox are going to go shopping for a starter this winter, whether it's via trade or free agency. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you assuming Dallas Keuchel is just day-to-day and he's going to be okay, you got your two top starters locked in for this season. Uh, but then, you know, Dylan Cease, you're starting to see some better stuff from. Dane Dunning, starting to see better stuff from. Um, neither one of those guys, I think, is, is front-line pitcher, but, uh, you know, you're getting some solid outings from them. You're seeing improvement. Uh and honestly, you don't need you don't need you Darvish stuff. You don't need um, Degrom stuff if you've got this lineup behind you because they're just you know they're putting up seven eight runs a game. Uh, you know you can you can get away giving up four or five runs and still win. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know I'm looking at Dylan Cease's numbers right now. He's got a three twenty nine ERA but his fielding independent pitching is 6.32. His strikeouts per nine are only 6.1. So I think he's got to start missing more bats. Um, I, You know, the walks are still a little high, but, you know, I, just pointing that out. But, yeah, I mean, going back to uh, to the lineup, yeah, I mean, they're scoring runs in big, big bunches, and they have a lot of big innings, and it seems like they, they're getting guys on base a lot and often. And, you know, people want to say, oh, it's the Royals, the Pirates. But like we talked about with the Cubs, you got to beat up on the terrible teams. I mean, the 15-16 Cubs, they beat the crap out of the Reds and the Pirates, and they were bad then too. So you got to beat the teams you're supposed to beat, and it's going to give them a lot of confidence going forward that they can do that. Um you know, you want to see him beat the Twins and the Indians, but hey, you know, they will they could have that chance late in the season or in October. You know, they're in a pretty good race right now because the Indians and the Twins are right there with them. And, you know, I got to say, it's pretty fun watching the AL Central right now. It, yeah, it is. It's, uh, you know, I still think the White Sox are the best team in there in that division. They're the most talented, I think. The, the Twins um, have been playing well. I, I I still don't but think they're, they're that good. They are a flawed team. Um, you know, we saw them take a nosedive. Um, and which is, I mean, they started off way better than I expected them to because I spent the whole offseason talking about how they were, they were frauds. And we'll, we'll see if they are because they've, they've really taken a nosedive. I mean, they can hit. There's no question they get hit. They have established hitters on that team. I just, I just don't think their pitching staff is anything to write home about. But I mean, you know, going back to the the White Sox pitching is, you know, Cease and Dunning are giving you enough to keep you in a ball game. It, it's honestly, it's you need somebody that's just not going to get blown out, cough Reynaldo Lopez, and is going to give you some solid innings to not not wear out your bullpen. Um, and, and they've been doing that. Um, you know, you sent down Lopez and you might get Carlos Rodon back. He pitched a, he pitched a simulated game yesterday. So I I was looking at the, the probables and the White Sox don't have anybody listed as a probable pitcher after tomorrow's game. I think cease is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, after that, they don't have anybody listed. So, um, you know, it, we might see Carlos Rodon sooner rather than later, especially given that Lopez was, was sent down. So, um, that's, uh, you know, that's good news for the, the White Sox is, I mean, although I'm not a big Carlos Rodon guy, um, you know, if, if it's work through a few innings, uh, not get beat up. Hopefully he can do that for you. You're not expecting him to be a frontline starter, right? And you're, and you're not, you're not putting that pressure on him to to be the the guy that stops a sh- losing streak, to be the guy that carries the burden. Um, that's on Dallas Keuchel and and Lucas Giolito, and um, 
Rodon is just go out there and and keep us in this ball game. And that's a lot easier of a, a of an ask than than on the on the north side where it's like, you know what? If you give up three runs, we might not win this game. Right. Yeah, because this White Sox team can score at will, and you know they've done that pretty well lately. You, you're seeing them hit some absolute rockets. Luis Robert hit a home run a few days ago in Kansas City. That might have been the furthest one I've ever seen there. You know, I don't know exactly what the longest home run is, but that had to be one of the longest in that stadium's history because that was an absolute blast. And you know, they're they're playing with confidence right now, and they feel like they could take on the world, and that's the attitude to have. They can make a run at this. I mean, you know, it's an expanded postseason. You're more than likely getting in. You're going to have a chance to maybe play some of the top uh, teams. And, you know, right now the White Sox, they're up and coming. They got nothing to lose. So, you know, go in there and make the most you can of it. And I I have very little doubt, almost no doubt, that this team will be in the playoffs. I mean, they should be in there. And, you know, you got Nick Madrigal back. Not too long ago, from he was out for like what a month almost. It was uh, a few weeks with with the shoulder, and he's back, and he's got a funny, a funny uh, slash line. Um, it's three seventy two, three eighty six, three seventy two. So there's there's no power in there at all. But the the guy and he's now walking a lot, but man, the guy makes contact. And I mean, honestly, that was kind of the scouting report on him, wasn't it? He, yeah, I, I didn't. I mean, I didn't know how how he was with walks, but man, he's not walking at all. He, uh, I don't think he really was a big walk power guy at all. I thought he was just simply put the ball in play. And and you know what? It's nice. You need those guys. Uh, is the Cubs are full of guys that are just it's feast or famine, and it the whole whole lineup is just a flawed construction. And the White Sox, uh, you know, they've got a lot of guys that can crush the ball but they've got guys that that can get on base they can make contact um you know you've got multiple contact guys and and that's huge that's huge in going into the playoffs is that you've got you don't live and die by the long ball right you're varying how you're scoring yep so you know if 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 Edwin Encarnacion is truly, you know, turning a corner and, and finding, uh, you know, his way, this team is just going to be an absolute juggernaut. Yep. Yep. And as a Cubs fan, I got to give him a lot of credit. I think they're building something incredibly special that's going to last quite some time. You got these guys locked up. And, yep. and, and you know the the White Sox haven't had like, you know, the best injury luck. They've they've had their share of injuries. Sure. Um, you know, you were hoping, you were hoping that you'd get Aaron Bummer back, and he was just moved to the forty five day disabled list. So with the, I mean, it's nerve and bicep issues. So you can't count on even seeing him for the rest of the season. If you anything you get from Aaron Bummer, if you get anything, is just gravy. So, you know, you've dealt with your injuries. Uh, They've had a lot of nagging injuries here or there, too, in the lineup as well. You know, you mentioned uh, Magical. Yohan Moncada's had a few things here or there. Um, I'm glad you brought up Moncada. You know, I I didn't know that he he had COVID-19. Yeah. Um, And he talked about how his lack of strength and energy. And you can can see that in – in him is at the plate. I mean, he's not he's not hitting the ball with power like he did. So you look at that as this is a guy you add him into into the lineup as being fully healthy. And good God, this is a an amazing team. Uh, right now is he's he's a meh hitter, and we we know that what he can be. You know, we've seen it. We've seen what he can do. I'm sure this is taking a toll on it. The COVID-19, I have very little doubt that that's having effects on him. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we've heard from a lot of folks that just even though they got it and uh, they were, they're recovering and, 
they're you know they're not going to die and it's no long term damage but it's the, the the their energy levels their um the strength they're just they're weak they're fatigued and and you know with a with an elite level baseball player that's just really taken its toll uh, i mean he's, his slash line is 237 333 397 um you know it's not awful it's not great it's it's meh but for a guy that's uh you know we know his capabilities uh it's it's you hope that given a few more weeks he can he can start he feeling better yeah and uh and then suddenly and then suddenly you're um you've got one more potent lethal bat in your lineup among many others <laughs> uh but i mean this team is this team is legit and you know we're m well more than halfway through the, the season and and you've got four mvp candidates on your team yeah it's special you could be on the cusp of multiple titles i know it's easy to you know you don't know what happens but i'd be shocked if they don't at least win one with this group i mean this is just this is talent like we've never seen before and you know, I, I got to hand it to him. I really do. I don't uh, remember the Cubs being this dominant, to be honest. I, I, I mean, 2016, they were pretty dang dominant, but I just feel like the White Sox are really set up well to do this over a long period of time. It's it's everyone. I mean, the thing with the with the Cubs is there was a bunch of guys that were like, all right, if they just take that step, we are going to, you know, we expected to see what the White Sox are seeing right now. If Schwarber takes that step, if Hap takes that next step, you know, and guys just never didn't, didn't take that step. And then you had other guys like Baez and, and Bryant who stepped backwards and you're just like, you know, we, if you don't, if you're not the two best players on this team, then then we're a really flawed team. Well, plus the inability to develop pitching and depth issues is also a big factor. Uh, so uh, I don't know. We'll we'll see how this goes. Uh, you know, we've we've got what three weeks left of the season. Yeah, it's already coming to an end soon. And so, you know, we'll. We'll see uh, come next week how how the health is faring if if Rodon is back if Quintana's back um, where we're at with Chatwood um, you know these health issues can really steer the direction of both both clubs in town um, you know a few a few starting pitchers coming back and giving you decent performances can really really give you a, a different perspective on, on how your team's going to perform come playoffs. Uh, and, and you know, or it can really help you to feel really pessimistic about where you are. Right. Um. Yeah, there's really not much hockey uh, until the draft. Um, basketball. Uh, you know, until we until we see the Bulls, the official list of of who they're bringing in to interview. Um. You know, it's a, uh, it's kind of not much going on. No. The one, the one nice thing is everyone th was like, oh, the Bulls, they, they delayed in, in firing their head coach. And now they're so far behind the eight ball and getting who they want. And really, uh, what are there four teams left without a head coach? And, um, and the, the Bulls basically have everybody that, that they were rumored to want anyway, still available. So it's, you know, they've got their pick of whoever they want and, you know, they can take their time and not, not feel rushed and actually, you know, it's nice. It's nice that they didn't fall into the, the trap of, of rushing because of some invisible pressure to, to rush and pick somebody. Right. Yeah, no, they got to take their time and evaluate and do the right thing. And 
I have a lot more faith that Arturis Karnasovas will make the right choice. I really do. Um, you know, I, I feel I feel pretty confident in uh, you know what what he's going to do, and you know who knows he might even bring somebody in that's a, a stopgap, like a Ricky Renteria type, where it's a right where they they're oh hey you know we're helping evaluate the young talent and getting them to grow, and then we'll bring in the next guy. Uh, that might even be a, a thing, or it's they bring in somebody that they it's a uh, a teacher and helping those guys get there and then they hope that they can guide him to be that that head coach um i mean you look you look at uh what's the name eric spolstra in miami and he was a guy that was we all laughed at him that he was just the guy sitting on the bench yeah he was just a water boy and then you realize that he might be a top five coach right now He's a great coach. Yeah. I mean, he's neutralizing Giannis. Uh, he's got Jimmy Butler, um, you know, working as a team and looking great. And I guess maybe maybe Jimmy Butler is one thing I want to mention is, you know, a lot of I'm seeing a lot of Bulls Twitter being like, oh, it was so stupid for the Bulls to get rid of Jimmy Butler. Really? Jimmy Butler didn't want to be here. Jimmy Butler. Jimmy Butler. How many teams has he gone to since he left the Bulls? And A number of them. And it seems like he finally matured and figured out, hey, this is who I am. This is who I need to be. This is what I need to do. He was not a mature young man at that point. He was a phenomenal basketball player. But he was just not a mature person, and he needed to figure things out. And you know, uh, it Minnesota didn't work out, and Philadelphia didn't work out. And you know, he he just needed he needed to figure things out. So there's other teams that had to let him go, and got far less in return than the Bulls did. Um, you know, that's. That's kind of life is it's not just the right player. It's the right player at the right time. Yep. No, that's, that's very true. So I'm not mad at all because he, you would have ended up paying him a lot of money. He still wouldn't have been happy. And you would be, if you would have kept him and he would have finally figured it out after all these years, there would have been a lot of animosity between the fans because you would have had to go through all the bullshit to get there. And you would you wouldn't have had, you know, the the young talent that you did. You wouldn't have a team around him. And can you imagine him with Jim Boylan? Oh boy. <laughs> that would be entertaining in its own way. Yeah. So, you know what? Everything worked out for I'm not going to say for the best. It worked out the way it needed to work out. And Jimmy Butler seems like he's in a good place right now. And hopefully the Bulls starting now are going to be in a much better place. Exactly. All right. Let's talk Chicago Bears. Here we go. Been waiting for this one. So we finally got our 53-man roster. And... I don't know. There was, there was, I guess, nothing like, oh my God, shocking. But there was a few peculiarities, I guess, to me. Um, Trubisky being the number one quarterback was so not surprising at all. I was going to say, that's the elephants in the room. And I think most people were pretty confident that he was going to be getting that job. I, I mean, here's here's the thing. First of all, it's... In order to to not be the starter day one, either Trubisky would have had to been so terrible in practices, um, in simulated <coughs> games, and Nick Foles would have had to been great. Like Nick Foles would have had to beat him by a lot in order to to take the starting job. And what it sounds like is they were pretty even, 
and even means Trubisky wins. Right, and you know, Matt Nagy tried to make it as neutral as possible, but we all knew Mitch was going to kind of get the benefit of the doubt in that scenario. Right, and you know, could it be partly because Ryan Pace drafted him and he's he's tied with Mitch Trubisky as far as in people's eyes, anything else good or bad Ryan Pace has done, he is tied to Mitch Trubisky. And if Mitch Trubisky figures it out, makes him look better. That could, that's a possibility. That's part of it. I don't think that's all of it. I think Ryan Pace is a little smarter than that. Um, I think he's willing to, to, to let his ego go a little bit. I think it comes down to this is if you can figure out Mitch Trubisky's um, is fixes quirks in his mechanics, then his athleticism elevates him to a much better level than Nick Foles. And Nick Foles, if he wins the starting job, this team becomes a a, a stopgap situation. They're going to ride as far as the defense will take them. Nick Foles won't lose them any games. He won't win them any games. He's he's a placeholder. Um, sure, he had some lightning in a bottle with the the Eagles, but Nick Foles is a, is a stopgap, and you're going to be back in a quarterback quandary after this. If Trubisky wins the competition and figures out things. And and don't forget, he's worked all off season. He worked with a quarterback guru, and working on his mechanics. And a, a lot of the things that were wrong with his throws were, um, you know, you can watch the film. It's poor mechanics, poor for uh, poor foot placement. So he has his, his feet aren't aligned correctly. Uh, he's he's got a, a planted back foot. He's th- shoulder throwing rather than stepping into throws his footwork is terrible and it leads to bad throws even even on plays where there's completions and he any he, you know you get a, a good chunk of yardage it's it was still a bad throw and it, it's it's a bad habit that he gets into but if you can fix that with Mitch Trubisky and you know there was a reason he was picked ahead of of the other guys that I'm not going to mention but if you figure them out, you you might figure out your quarterback situation for a number of years. Um, so your your the reward is much higher with with Mitch Trubisky. Nick Foles is a much older quarterback. He's got a ceiling, and Trubisky. Uh, you know, I think Trubisky's floor is much lower than Nick Foles, but his ceiling is much higher. And I think you owe it to yourself to try to to try to rise to the occasion rather than settling on on a manager. Yeah, and I mean those points are all valid, and I can't say I disagree with them. I just I'm just not that hopeful he's just going to magically figure everything out, even in with all this work. I the the main thing with me is I just the football IQ just doesn't appear to be there. That's what really gets me. Now, if he fixes some of his mechanical stuff, then I could I think we'll see a better quarterback. But do I ever see like a good or great one with him? I don't. I I just don't. Um, I, I get what you mean by the ceiling is potentially higher with Trubisky. He is more athletic than Nick Foles. You know, no question about that. Um, and, you know, he's worked with Matt Nagy, obviously, in consecutive years. And, um, you know, Foles has been around, obviously, um, with that tree. But, you know, he's been part of this. Trubisky's been with the team longer. He kind of knows the current system and culture a little better. Put that value how you will, honestly. But, uh, again, I'm not surprised by the decision. And I am really hoping that Mitch Trubisky can figure things out. All I'm saying is I'm just not overly confident it's going to happen yet. I, I'm not either, but I'm going to I'm gonna ask you a question and I'm hopefully lead it to 
the, a stat first. Okay. So what position was just abysmal last year for the Bears? Quarterback? Worse than the quarterback. Somewhere on the offensive line. At tight end. Oh, tight. Okay. Yeah. Tight end, I think, was just ab- abysmal. Do, and, you don't think it was abysmal. All right. So, no Bears tight end last year had more than 14 catches or 91 yards. Yeah, that's that's bad. All right. So, now I'm going to. So, we saw that was just. It was a black hole. It was, it was basically a, a non existent position. So now, uh, Mitch Trubisky's passer rating in games when a tight end goes for at least 40 yards is 112.94. Okay. That's his passer rating. Career. In games uh, with at least a tight end going for at least 40 yards. That's one of the things that makes me a little hopeful. Is do I think we're going to see Mitch Trubisky suddenly look like Patrick Mahomes? No, but we we saw him. He worked with a independent quarterback guru on his footwork all off season. So you hope he's figured out some of those things. Does that help him read defenses better? No, but if if we've got much better tight end production that Matt Nagy's systems can hopefully uh you know ease things up, get guys open, make some easy throws for him and have him get into a rhythm. And if he can at least hit those easy throws which he was missing last year and you upgrade that tight end position, maybe we have a serviceable Mitch Trubisky. That's that's my that's my big hope. Yeah, you know I what I can say with some confidence right now going into this Bears season is that it can't be worse than last year unless, you know, there are obviously injuries, but injuries are a whole thing where it's kind of out of your control and they just kind of happen. But, you know, let's say that the team is for the most part healthy, Mitch Trubisky's healthy, the offensive line is healthy, and all the targets, tight ends around him are healthy. You know, I don't think it can be worse than last year because if his footwork is better and his mechanics are better, like I said earlier, I'm not saying it'll be guaranteed great or good, but I think it will at least see some improved play. You know, better tight ends can make a big difference. I don't know really what to expect from the tight ends, but again, I don't think they could be as bad or worse as last year. If Jimmy Graham is healthy, I think what you're going to get is minimum production that you want and minimum production that we want is better than we got last year. And Hey, Cole Komet, I think there's some promise there. It's just, you never know with a rookie who's never played before, but I do think that he is a good enough guy to be a tight end in the, uh, in the NFL. So it's gotta be better than last year. It just, it has to be. I mean, last year, it was a lot of practice squad type tight ends. Yeah, it was. It really it was it was guys that aren't even playing right now. Um, it was it was some terrible quarterback. I mean, tight end play. Um, so not surprising. Mitch Trubisky, quarterback one. Um. So uh, one shocking thing: Kevin Tolliver not making the team. Yeah, I know a lot of people were su- were surprised by that. So, with Artie Burns getting hurt and being done for the season, I think it really it showed how thin the depth is at co- a cornerback for the Bears. So, I, I mean, you probably feel pretty confident with with Fuller on the one side, and on. As a slot corner, I really like the the competition between Duke Shelley and Buster Screen. I think they're both good slot corners. I think you have two good slot corners. But on the other outside is um, Jalen Johnson, who they drafted high and they're very excited about him, has been 
nagging injuries. So is he healthy? Um, yeah, that's the question and, with him. I don't think there's any doubt on the talent. Uh, you've got Vildor, who's a, a, another young guy. And that leads you to um, you've got you've got five cornerbacks. I just you're carrying between tight ends. Um, you're you're carrying one, two, three, four, five, five tight ends and six wide receivers, but only five cornerbacks. I just think that's a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, there's a few veterans out there that none of them, none of them, you know, get me excited, but they at least you're like, I have a veteran in there where I can trust what they're going to do. Um, the most obvious one would be Prince of Mukamara. Um, sure. He was not great last year, but if, if he's, if he's there as a, a backup role for a league minimum, cause he's not, he's free agent. Um, I, I would not be opposed to that. Uh, Sidney Jones is available. Um, Marcus Sherrill's Cravon LeBlanc. Um, oh, bring him home. Cravon LeBlanc. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, he had some nice years with, with Philadelphia. Uh, Trumaine Johnson is available. I, I I'm going to throw this name out there. I, I'm, I know somebody will angrily rant about this. Um, I'm not saying to get him, but Akib Talib is available. And he's a shell of his former self. Um, but I don't know. He's 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 been a long time good player. How about you dunk him tires. in the fountain of youth first and then bring him here? <laughs> uh yeah, so I, I would like to see them bring in a veteran cornerback. Um you know it just makes me nervous with having no, in a passer happy division, in a passer happy league, having not a lot of depth at cornerback. Yeah, I know. And uh, Jalen Johnson, him being healthy, can make a really big difference right there, just alone. And you know, we're looking at these injuries, and you know, the, the big guys for the most part are healthy in here, but you know, injuries are going to happen throughout the year. And I think one of the biggest problems with this Bears team outside of some things we already talked about, kind of to your point already, the team just doesn't have that much depth in certain areas that you really need. And I think that the secondary, while you obviously have some talent in the secondary, obviously Eddie Jackson uh, is your best safety. Kyle Fuller is your, probably your best corner. I mean, not probably. He is your best corner. Um and if Jalen Johnson is healthy, you obviously have some talent in there. But, you know, you look at the rest of the depth. You got Deion Bush and Sherrick McManus at safety. You know, that's some solid depth there. But, you know, outside that, you're you're kind of hurting a little bit. And you hope that Buster Screen can be able to do what he did last year because he was pretty decent last year. I have a feeling if, if need be, Buster Screen kicks to the outside – and Duke Shelley steps in and plays the the slot corner, um, so I think that's probably how it plays out. But I would still like to see a veteran be able to come in and play. Yeah, I agree. Um, the other head scratcher is your running back depth. Is what running back depth? Uh, so on August twenty sixth. David Montgomery tweaked his groin. Mm -hmm. It was expected to be a two to four week recovery, which would mean that looking at my, my handy dandy calendar here is, um, that's a calculator. Let's probably look at the calendar. Um, so it was on the 28th, uh, 6th. So it has been a week and a half so two weeks would be um, two weeks would be this week. So he theoretically could miss if it's a, it goes the full week, four weeks. Um, 
missed two games. Not ideal. Not ideal, so which would mean you're going in with your running backs of Ryan Nall, Cordero Patterson, and Tariq Cohen. <sighs> which goes back to why didn't they at least kick the tires on Leonard Fournette? Yeah, I know a lot of people were asking that, and now he's what on the Bucks, right? He's on the Bucks. And yeah, they're loading up. I know, um I know a lot of those people on the Bucks are older, but still they're they're getting a lot of big names there. But anyway. I mean, yeah, I Leonard mean, Fournette is not old. He was drafted in the same draft as Mitch Trubisky. I know he's not old. I'm just saying there are other players on that team that are old. Well, Tom Brady's uh, old Leonard, enough to make everybody else on the team old. <laughs> Touche. Uh, yeah, I mean, Leonard Fournette, I thought, would have been a guy to at least look at. Or like you said, kick the tires. <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned Devonta Freeman. I don't know if he's still available. I don't know how much he'd give you. But I just, I feel like you got to bring somebody in if that's the case. Tariq Cohen's not a number one running back. He's not really even that much of a running back. He's a, you know... You you throw dump screens to him and he tries to run up field. You know I, I like David Montgomery, but if he's got a groin injury, I want like a a bell cow back that's just you can pound away. I agree. And Leonard Fournette is I don't think I mean we've seen some really amazing things out of Leonard Fournette in the NFL, but we've seen some mediocre things. But for a guy on a one year, you could have brought him in one year four million dollars. And, uh, and you, you could have easily absorbed that, not have to pay him anything after this year. And you can, you could put Ryan Nall back on the, uh, practice squad. And then even if, even if you don't shift your depth at all, you know, he is there as, uh, a nice, a nice short yardage back. He's there if somebody gets injured or hell, if he has a great game and is busting holes, you could ride him. Like these are these are the types of things I, I just don't understand. Is Cordero Patterson is not going to be, you know, carrying it twenty times a game. Tariq Cohen yeah. is not going to be. And if David Montgomery is hurt, are you going to be? Are you going to give these twenty carries to Ryan Nall? I I wouldn't want to see that. I mean. Tariq Cohen and Cordell Patterson, you're using their legs, not their power and strength as running backs if they're in that position. If they're in the backfield, you're not going to be handing off to Cordell Patterson 15-plus times to try to pound through an offensive line. You're going to try to dump something off to him where he can try to find a lane and use his speed to burst through a hole. You're not going to be looking to ground pound with him. And again, the same with Tariq Cohen. You're not going to do that with any of those guys. You know what I would like to see though is mm. Cordero Patterson catching catching like a nice crisp one from in the flat and then having having some slow linebacker try to catch him and just turning on the jets from that point. Like I love that. Or I or, do too. Or if the offensive line is porous and you you set up a screen pass and you dump it off to uh, a Cordero Patterson and get him a full head of steam and just watch him go. I would love yeah. to see, you know, where it's you're pinned back at your goal line and the other team is just getting to the quarterback quick and you dump one and he takes it 80 yards and just nobody even touches him. Like just gives me, gives me the sweats. Oh yeah. I mean, I want to see that too. And I'm sure we will see plays like that. I just think you need a guy that can pound a bit, and Cohen and Patterson can't do that. It, it would honestly be nice to have a guy like Jordan Howard back if David Montgomery is out, but but you know, Leonard that's Fournette is the option. Leonard Fournette is, is uh, you know a better Jordan Howard. That's, yeah, he is, and that's that's what you you could have done. And it's, yeah, I think does it. Here is my thinking about Leonard Fournette. Does it hurt you in any way? No, not at all. All it does is is it makes you go, oh, Ryan Nall, you're back on the practice squad. And it doesn't cut into your cap space for next year. It doesn't cripple you financially. Um, and it it makes your running back depth better. Uh, a lot better. 
is a lot better. Is you've got your two headed monster with with Fournette and Montgomery, and you've got your gadget backs with Patterson and Cohen, and it's you, a nice balance. It's a nice balance. Is you've got power, you've got speed, and you are set up. If somebody gets hurt, if Cohen gets hurt, a lot of those plays that he could run, you could have Patterson run. If Montgomery uh-huh. gets hurt. You could have Leonard Fournette do a lot of those things. Um, it, I just, I think, I think that was a wasted potential. The only, the only situation why I think it could have been detrimental to your finances is if you're going to give Allen Robinson a contract extension and utilize all the cap space you have this year, considering you're not paying Eddie Goldman, is all the cap space you have this year and use it to pay a big chunk of of your extension to Allen Robinson this year and save you on the cap space last or the next couple of years. Like well, if you're we're still waiting on that. If you're going to do that, I go, "Okay, more power to you." Then I I'm all aboard. But if you're just going to sit on this cap space, then you, shame on you for not bringing in a, a player who is better than what you have. Yeah, I mean, I just, if you have some cap space to use and you have some holes on this roster, you might as well use it. But, it, I mean, right now, all I can hope for is that Montgomery is back as soon as possible. And and I'm I'm not going to be the guy that says, oh, Leonard Fournette is going to make or break this team. He Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. What I'm saying is Leonard Fournette is better than Ryan Nall. Fact. He is better than Ryan Nall. And so thus Ryan Nall being on your 53, if you can add a player that's better than a guy at the same position on your 53, it makes you a better team. That's what I'm saying. Leonard Fournette is better than Ryan Nall. Hmm. I better check my stats on that. <laughs> that's impossible. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to look at the fantasy football rankings and see if that's true or not. <laughs> uh... Let's see. Um, safety, I'm fine with your safety depth. Um, you know, I don't know who's going to win that other safety spot, Deion Bush or Tashawn Gibson. Um, you might see a flip flopping there. But even if even if one of those guys goes down, there's actually safeties on the market that are that are legit safeties. Mm-hmm. Um, they might be older, but there's actually veterans out there that are good. So I'm I'm actually comfortable with your safety right now, uh, but Kevin Tolliver not even on the practice squad. That just shocked no, me. Yeah. I thought he was going to be in the mix for your starter, and it looks like he's going to Denver. So, oof, it's weird. Um, let's see, tight ends. You kept five. You kept Jimmy Graham, Cole Komet, Demetrius Harris, J.P. Holtz, and Eric Saubert, who is basically a glorified offensive lineman, um, which means you're you're really going to try to power run because you don't have a fullback on the team, so you're gonna you're gonna utilize this extra blocking tight end, um, and you you put up another kicker on your practice squad. Is his name? Gabby ruled by any chance? <laughs> no, it is Ryro Srantos. Uh, uh, oh. But uh, that makes me question how healthy is Eddie Pinero? <laughs> yeah. You know, if Eddie Pinero is healthy, I actually am pretty comfortable with him as the kicker. But, you know, we saw last year when he had the pinch nerve where he started to struggle a little bit midseason. And I know there's some question right now. Um, if he ends up being fully healthy, then I do feel like I can be pretty comfortable with him as kicker. We shall see. Um, but looking at uh, at your team, the front seven of the defense, I'm pretty confident with. They brought in Mario Edwards, who I thought was a steal for what they just being a a free agent, not giving up anything for him. Uh, which makes me think we're probably going to see Akeem Hicks a lot more at nose tackle. Um, and if that's the case, and we're seeing Bilal Nichols, 
uh, Akeem Hicks and Mario Edwards as your three interior linemen. It's those guys it's are healthy. Good. That, that's going to be tough to run on. It's pretty good. Real, yeah, and real we've tough. seen we've seen when Akeem Hicks is playing how they're just able to shut down those running backs, those run games. You know, we saw when they played two years ago. I'll never forget that Sunday night game against the Vikings where Cook was just stopped in his tracks and the only place he went was backwards. Those guys are healthy, then you're basically forcing the other team to throw the football. And and the thing is, is if we have a healthy Robert Quinn and a healthy Khalil Mack, those are two double-digit sack guys. Mm-hmm. And if you can't run the ball and you're forced to pass, whew, I mean, Robert Quinn, if he's healthy, is such such an upgrade from Leonard Floyd. Yeah, I mean, look, Leonard Floyd was not a terrible football player, but he was paid and drafted to get to the quarterback, and he just did not do that nearly enough. No, he didn't. Um, and, you know, your your depth at edge rusher after Mack and Quinn gets a little suspect. Um, you got Travis Gibson, who... He, you're, you know, he's young, but you're high on. Barkevius Mingo, who was drafted, I think he was the sixth overall pick a few years ago. But It's a great name. I know, it really is. I remember when he was drafted, I was like, that guy's name is Barkevius Mingo. I love that name. And he mm-hmm. never lived up to the the billing. Um, but, you know, maybe being situational. Uh, James Vauders, who was a, was a guy we all loved last year in the preseason, and we're all bummed that he didn't make the squad made the squad this year. So you've got some some younger younger guys and some guys with high promise. Um you know, but if if poop hits the fan, you know, there's veterans out there that are you can't put them in there for all your snaps, but in situational pass rushing, you know, there's guys out there that you can go get that can step in and, and get to the quarterback. Yeah, look, I mean, if they're all if they're all healthy, then I think they're going to be getting the quarterback quite a bit because it's going to be hard to contain both Mac and Robert Quinn. Um, absolutely, I, I think so. That's my hope, and, and I really hope Danny Trevathan is healthy this year because need- he makes a big difference, even if he's not making the most shiny, spectacular plays. His presence on the field, his leadership, and the small things he does on the field, it there's a big difference. Yeah, so, I mean, in the, the middle, you've got Roquan Smith and Danny Trevathan, and if both those guys are healthy, I, I think that's probably the best linebacker tandem in the NFL. And Comeback you, player of the year, Roquan and, Smith, just saying. And if you put your four linebackers, Quinn, Mack, Smith, and Trevathan together, who, what linebacking core is better than that? Hard to find one. Um, we talked about the cornerback depth and the the safety depth. So defense, I think, I think you're going to see another good year. You might even, you might even see a better year than last year, which was pretty good. It's hard to have the, the performance from two years ago. That but, was just like th- that's something you see once every while because that was just insane what they did. Um, but. You know, I, I expect them to be as good, if not better, than last year because I expect them to get to the quarterback more. I agree. I agree. And the health of Akeem Hicks also plays a big role, too, and Danny Trevathan. I mean, you know, those two guys were hurt for a lot of the year, and that made a big difference. And they were still able to be a pretty good defense. They just they weren't getting the quarterback enough, and they weren't gen- generating enough turnovers. If you get the more you get to the quarterback, the more turnovers you are going to generate because you're either going to have pressure on the quarterback where he's not throwing with a clean line of sight, he's throwing while he's getting hit by the ball, and if you're reaching him, you might be able to jar the ball loose more often. You'll see the quarterback naturally fumble more if you're getting to the quarterback more. So as long as they're getting to the quarterback more, I think your turnovers are just going to go up. That's the hope. Now, on the other side of the ball, there's a lot of question marks here. 
I mean, we already we already know all the question marks that go with the quarterback position in, in Mitch Trubisky, and um, the nice thing is he's got a he's probably got a very short leash, and he probably knows he has a very short leash. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at him with Nick Foles with a arguably the best backup quarterback in the league. Um, got to be up there, yeah. Uh, so. You know, but you have question marks at quarterback. You've got question marks that we went through on the running back position. The offensive line last year was not very good, Mm-mm. and you're returning four or five starters. Your your only new starter is uh, Jermaine Effetti, who you thought there was going to be a competition at that right guard position between him and Rashad Coward, but apparently Jermaine Effetti just ran away with it. Yeah. Um, you know and- what my hope is for the line? I really hope Charles Leno kind of comes back from sucking and does what he did two years ago. Uh, Cody Whitehair, I mean, was not very good last year. I I don't know if it's the, the blocking scheme that what what it, what happened. I don't know. They because were, Cody Whitehair was a pretty consistently good player before. I mean, Leno was good before. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm just hoping that. You know, it's funny. You listen to like Greg Gabriel and, and some some other guys that have been in the league that are old, you know, codgers and and gritty guys. They'll they'll be like, they loved they loved the guy that the Bears let go at at uh, as offensive line coach, and they're like, you won't find anybody better than him. So if you're expecting, um, you know, the new coach to to make the improvement then you're sorely mistaken. And I just, my hope is that, you know, it, they were coaching to a scheme where it was kind of players were fish out of water and that maybe if we play to strengths better, that we'll get better results. But, um, you know, the offensive line is going to have to be better. We're going to have to run the ball better than we did. I mean, if... This, if Cody Whitehair can be the player he normally is, and Charles Leno can be the player that he normally was, those two guys improving, I think, could really make a positive difference. I don't ever see this line being great, but I think that, you know, look at 2018. The run blocking wasn't great in 2018, but protecting the quarterback, I felt they were good enough. If you can get good enough for quarterback protection and get decently improved on uh run blocking then you know that that could make a a decently noticeable difference but again those are ifs i don't know if cody white here is going to bounce back i don't know if charles leno jr is going to bounce back i just i i do think it is weird to your point and maybe it was the scheme that all of a sudden charles leno and cody white hair we're having pretty down years. I mean, Charles Leno was noticeably down last year. Everybody saw it. Yeah, so you know, we're we're looking to make a massive improvement with other than tight ends with pretty much very similar team from last year. The offensive line, four or five starters are back. It's the same running backs, same quarterback. Uh, most of the same wide receivers. It's you just improving the tight end position. And suddenly the hope is you're just going to be a completely different team on offense. That, that has me nervous. I'm not going to lie. I, I feel you. I feel you. I think I, I have to say I'm feeling pretty okay about the wide receiver situation. Allen Robinson is a top tier talent. I I still have faith that Anthony Miller is really going to be a force in this league. I do feel like he's not going to be the level of Allen Robinson, but I do feel like he will be a good player. We've seen the flashes of it, and I think this is a great year for him to really turn it up and show that to everybody. Cordero Patterson, the guy can run like the wind. Uh, They brought in Ted Jinn Jr., who is not going to be, in my opinion, anything special, but somebody that can just be a nice veteran force um, as a receiver. And he's then you got Javon Wins and Riley Ridley. Ted Ginn Jr. is basically going to be your speedster. Is You didn't have anybody anybody that could stretch the field last year. 
after uh, what's his face got hurt. Um, oh, Turbo. After he got hurt, is you didn't have anybody with speed at your wide receiver position is no, you didn't is Cordero Patterson. You didn't really put him in. So, but you didn't have anybody that could take the top off the ball. And you, now you have two of those guys. You have Ted Ginn jr. And you have Mooney who's who you drafted. And both of those guys can are absolute barn burners can take the top off the ball. And it adds, it adds a level of, Hey, we can go deep. And you've got to defend us deep because we've got those guys. Miller, for whatever it's worth, um, is Matt Nagy said he was the best player in training camp. Mm-hmm. I, I'm high on him. I still have faith. Allen Robinson is a, a number one wide receiver. Uh, Ridley is a, Ridley and Wims are guys that we we know they have talent. Can they put it together? So well, really needs to be able to play. He's got to be active to play. I think, you know, if he's going to prove it, let him play. So, I mean, you, you've, I'm okay with the wide receiver position. It's, it's going to be, if they can't protect the quarterback, the quarterback is not hitting targets and uh, you can't run the ball and making them be passing, then man, we're done for. Yeah, you, same problem as last year. You might not see the the amazing numbers for the wide receivers because, honestly, I think Cole Komet and Jimmy Graham are going to put up stupid numbers. I mean, comparatively, because I think, I think Trubisky is going to feel that pressure, and I think a lot of it is going to, instead of stepping up and going, you know what, I'm the man, this is my team – it's going to be like, I don't want to lose this position, and he's going to use them as safety valves. And you're going to see a lot of dump-offs to the tight end. You know, I just want to talk about the tight ends really quick. You know, I'm looking at the top four guys, and, you know, the top three, to me, were pretty obvious. Jimmy Graham's your number one. Cole Komet's number two. I'm not surprised at all. Demetrius Harris, he's the veteran. You had to have him. And then you were looking kind of at those uh, four or five spots, and you know, Ben Broniker was cut. There was talk, you know, would he be back or not? What do you think of them going with J.P. Holtz? I mean, I, to me, it's not much to think about because it's a fourth tight end, but it's I don't know. What's your Special opinion? teams, and if he needs to come in and play, if somebody gets injured, um, he was the one that had, from what I'm hearing, had rhythm with Mitch Trubisky during training camp. Sure. So he can play special teams, and if, he, if forced into playing time, He's the guy that had the most rhythm with the with your your starting quarterback. Uh, that it just makes sense you keep him. Um, Saubert is is the guy that you're gonna you know you don't have a fullback. He's your blocking tight end, so you're not gonna put Jimmy Graham in there to block because that's not what he wants to do, and no. he's not good at it. Is Jimmy Graham, who is, you know what, he was not good last year. He acknowledges he wasn't good last year. He's looked good, but you know, uh, did was he put in the right positions f- to to succeed with with the Packers? Um, that was a just a weird offense last year that never got into rhythm anywhere. So hopefully, hopefully having him on the team with the Bears that they utilize him like a Travis Kelsey, where. He's not staying in there to block. He's going out there as a as a create mismatches as a receiver. And from what I understand, Jimmy Graham has looked good. Cole Komet has looked good. Both guys mm-hmm. have looked very good. And it's going to be honestly, just putting this out there, is I would not be surprised if in a two game span that they already have more production than they did all of last year from the tight ends. I mean, it wouldn't be saying much, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either. 14, I mean, that's just how bad it was last year. 14 catches, 91 yards. I, I oh. bet Jimmy Graham has that in two games. Yeah, even in his washed-up state, I still think that he'll be able to at least produce where you hopefully want. I'm not expecting great Jimmy Graham. I just, at the most, I'm expecting serviceable, do your job at minimum, and you know, like I said before on the show, doing your job at minimum is is better than 
what you got out of last year at the tight ends. Uh, let's see. Um, those are the topics I want to talk about other than, oh, so ESPN did a simulation for the entire season. I think they said they did like 30,000 simulated games. Mm -hmm. They have the Bears beating the Packers twice this year. What? And finishing seven and nine. Ha! Would that be something? Well, didn't they do that in, was it was 2007. Remember 2007, they finished seven and nine, but they beat the Packers twice. You know, you remember that? Yeah, it's one of those things. Is you're like, all right. On the one hand, I can hang my hat on that, and you know, would would you rather be seven and nine but beat the Packers twice, or have it where you're what thirteen and three but lose to the Packers twice? Oh, I'll take the thirteen and three all day. Well, we saw what happened there, and they beat you in the they beat you in the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I wanted to talk about my final predictions before we, um, you know, start the season. Because our next show will be talking about week one versus the Lions. I took the same sheet. I wrote my initial predictions that we heard when we had the schedule released way, way back, months back. And now that we know what the roster looks like, we know what other rosters look like, and we kind of get a sense of, who might be healthy, who might not be. I've kind of redid my win-loss predictions, and I have my standings predictions ready. So I thought I might as well share those, right? Do you want to go game uh, by game, or do you? Yeah, I'll just go game by – we could go game by game. Why not? All right. Game. So Go ahead. You go. No, go ahead. Week one at Detroit. I still, you know, I, I think it could be a close game, but I'm going to go with confidence and say they'll win. I've got win. At home versus the New York football giants. Win. Win. At Atlanta Falcons. Win. I've lost. I was on the fence with that one. I'm like, uh, I don't know. I think, um, I think this is the alternate year where the Falcons are good this year. I think they alternate. One it. year it's bad, one year they're good. I think it's their year to be good. Um, I wouldn't be. Let's just say I I pick a win, but I'm not surprised. It would not surprise me if they lost. Yeah, I, same thing. I I picked loss, but if the Falcons if the Falcons can't protect Matty Ice, then the Bears could just decimate them. Yeah. Um, game four at home versus the Colts. I got a loss. I've got loss. At home versus the Tom Brady's. Loss. Loss. At home. I'm sorry. At Carolina. I got a win. Um, I didn't. Ooh, mm -mm. I'm looking for. Oh, there we go. Uh. At the Los Angeles Rams. When, and I don't think that's going to be a necessarily pretty game to watch. I just think if their defense is fully geared and ready to go, I think that they'll be able to shut down Goff and the offense, kind of like they, what they did in 2018. I have loss. At home versus the Saints. Loss. I have loss. Um, at the Tennessee Titans. Oh, that's a loss. I have a loss. Um, I mean, I could see a win there. It's but I, it'll be an ugly win because if if they can stop Derrick Henry, I don't see, I don't see their quarterback beating the Bears defense. But I also see their defense causing mayhem as far as uh, throwing a loop to Mitchell that's Trubisky. That's where I'm at. That's, so that's I, exactly how I feel. I see if they win that game, it's going to be like the Rams win from from two years ago. It, that'll be like a that'll be like a sixteen to fourteen win if oh, it I, is. I think that's a I think that's a twelve to nine win. <laughs> All field goals. <laughs> um, at home versus the Minnesota Vikings. Win. I have win. At Green Bay Packers. See, originally I had this as my confidence upset win, but I'm changing that to a loss. I've got win. 
At home versus the Detroit Lions. Win. I have win. Uh, at home versus the Houston Texans. At first I had this as a win, and I still don't know what Bill O'Brien's doing down there, but I did change this to a loss. I have this as a loss. Um, at Minnesota Vikings. I had this as a loss, and then I thought about it. I thought about how the Bears have played up there. I change it to a win. I think they'll win up there. I've got win. Uh, at Jacksonville. Win. I have win. I think that's a disaster team. And then at home versus the Green Bay Packers. It's going to be a heartbreaking loss. I think that is a heartbreaking loss as well. I think they split the series against Green Bay, but I think they they win on the road and lose at home. And I give them eight and eight this year. I got nine and seven. That's my final prediction. I was originally 10 and six. I'm moving to nine and seven. Um, I have the standings predictions too in the NFC North if you want to hear them. I would like to hear that. Okay. So here we go. Here are my standings predictions for the NFC North. Now the first place pick, I just want to make clear, I don't think that they're really that good of a team. I really don't. But they'll find a way. And that's Green Bay, 11-5. and five. Again, I'm not convinced they're that good. I'm really not. Rodgers is getting older. The team around them, I just don't think is that special. But they'll find a way to win 11 games because they just find ways to do it. And it pisses me off. Having a Hall of Fame quarterback makes you an infinitely better team. Even when you're on the back nine of your career, it makes you an infinitely better team. And... It, you can you can be suspect in a lot of areas, but being locked at the quarterback in the NFL makes you a competitor. Yep. And in second place, I got the Bears at nine and seven. Third, I have the Vikings eight and eight. I'm kind of doing that on off on off with the Vikings, and I just I, they lost some talent, and I don't think they really made that up back and. Still don't think Kirk Cousins carries them very far. They'll be good enough to be competitive. They still got a good defense, even though they lost some guys. And yeah, I just see them being an 8-8 eight and eight team this year. I don't know what your thoughts are. Well, I mean, it, it's pretty safe to, to chalk in the Packers, number one, and the Lions, number four. So <laughs> that's sort of just how it goes until somebody proves it otherwise. But um, I think the Bears are a better team than than the Vikings, and um, and Kirk Cousins is a suspect quarterback. Yeah, and I just think that the past few years, the Bears' ability to beat the Vikings has, you know, helped them on that regard. So I think that if they can continue that, that can make the big. Uh, really make a big distinction between who's two and who's three. Whoever wins that season series, obviously. Yeah, so we've got week one and uh, Detroit Bears uh, in Detroit on Sunday. Um, I'm excited uh, to see some football. No uh, fans, though. That'll be weird. You know, I don't know what teams are allowed to have fans and what not, aren't. I figured no teams would have fans, but I just read that the the Browns were approved to have six thousand fans in the stadium. Really? Huh. Which well, makes I me, mean which makes me wild. wonder is at what point is it not worth to have fans in the stadium? Because you know, if you have fans in the stadium, you've got to have like ushers and security and parking attendants and vendors and like what you know, how many people do you need in order to to have your staff there? Yeah. Um, so is six thousand enough? I mean, that's that's like it's probably a sixty thousand person stadium, roughly. So well, one ten. Cleveland just wants to win something so they can win the attendance race. Um, so I don't know if other teams are allowed to have fans or not. I'm pretty sure Detroit won't have fans there. I got to double check, but um, I, I thought they weren't having anyone in for at least the first two games. I know the Bears aren't doing are, are doing that. So the Bears will not have fans. So here we go. Um, 
the the Arizona Cardinals will not have fans at games at least the first two games. Um, Atlanta will not have fans for the month of September. The Ravens are no fans for right now. The Bills are no fans for the first two games. Carolina will have no fans for the first game. The Bears will have no fans, period. They agreed to not allow fans at all for the 2020 season. The Bengals will have no fans for the first game. Um, the uh, the Browns are TBD, but they apparently they're allowed to have up to 20% of capacity. So that would be like 13,000 people. Um, Dallas will have fans at the games. I'm not surprised. Um, there will be no fans at the home opener for the Broncos. There'll be no fans in the stadiums for the first, at least the first two games for the Lions. Right. So the home opener for the Lions, which will be against the Bears, who won't see any fans. Right. Green Bay will have no fans for the at least the first two games. Um, and their president and CEO said that they had they expect a maximum of ten to twelve thousand fans uh, when they're allowed to have fans. Oh, on Green Bay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Houston, no fans for the first game. The Colts will have a 25% capacity. So, um, like, um, like 15, 16,000 people. Um, the Jaguars will have 25% capacity, so roughly the same, 15, 16,000. The Chiefs will have fans approximately 22% of their of their uh capacity which their capacity is 73,000. The Raiders will have no fans at all for the season. The Chargers will have no fans for now. But I would be shocked if Los Angeles allowed them to. Same with the Rams. Um the Dolphins will have 13,000 fans for their home opener. The Vikings will have no fans for their first two games. The Patriots will have no fans for their first two games. The Saints will have no fans for their first game. The Giants will have no fans, period. The Jets will have no fans, period. The Eagles have no fans, until further notice. The Steelers, no fans for the first two games. The 49ers, no fans for the first game, but I would be shocked if if they were allowed to. Um, Seahawks, no fans for the first three games. Buccaneers, no fans for the first two games. Uh, Titans, no fans for the first game. Washington football team, no fans, period. So and no are. name either. No name. I do. I'm not gonna lie. I do like the helmets with the numbers on them. They are kind of cool. Yeah. So I, I hope they keep that, whatever they call themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You know, man, it's just gonna be so weird. Soldier Field with nobody there. Bears uh, Packers Week 17 in front of a crowd of zero. Yeah. Well, at least there'll be no booze. Yeah. Uh, was well, there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think I said my piece. I think um, just ready to roll with this Bears season, and hopefully we could see more good than bad. You know, I just I'm not getting my hopes up too high. I at least can feel somewhat confident that they'll be a competitive team, and by competitive, I mean not totally awful. I don't see a Super Bowl winning team or even a team that goes on a long run, but. If they could be good enough to at least make a playoff spot, then, you know, obviously a lot can happen. So 
here's to another season, I guess. It's going to be a weird one without the fans. It's going to be weird with, you know, the world we're living in right now. But, um, you know, here we are ready to play another Bears season. It's all you can ask for. Be better than last year and let's just play through this year and hope for better things. Right on. Um, that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Please hit subscribe however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, TuneIn app, Spotify, Google Play. We're on them all. Share this podcast with your friends. It's how we grow the show. Follow us uh, on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com. Thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Come Glenn! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like the number New Yorkers. Smoking crack is not legal on the planes. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.